first time in over a decade, peak demand on the grid is rising. We're electrifying new parts of our economy, heating, industrial processes, and critically, transportation. Between now and 2030, we're expecting to add about 60 gigawatts of peak demand to the grid. Now, as we electrify new parts of our economy, we are increasing the amount of energy that we consume in any given day or year, and we're increasing that maximum point-in-time demand that the grid must serve. And historically, our approach to serving rising demand has been to build up supply infrastructure. We've built natural gas peaker plants that turn on for maybe 5% of hours of the year. And we've upgraded our grid equipment, our wires and substations and feeders, so that they can handle that max demand and then run at maybe 15% capacity the rest of the time. Now, I've spent a lot of years outside of the electricity industry that have told me that those are very low utilization rates, particularly for a machine that has cost us trillions of dollars to build and maintain, the US grid. So virtual power plants, or VPPs, present an alternative and more efficient approach. VPPs are aggregations of distributed energy resources, such as rooftop solar with batteries, or EVs and EV charging infrastructure, smart thermostats, or commercial and industrial flexible loads that can help balance supply and demand for electricity and provide other services to the grid, just like a traditional power plant. And different types of VPPs use different portfolios of distributed energy resources in different ways. But one critical way is to shift the timing of demand to shrink those peaks. So imagine, you come home from work, it's around dinner time, and you crank up your AC because it's a hot summer day. And you plug in your electric vehicle, it starts charging, and your neighbors do the same. That creates a big spike in evening electricity demand, that black line on the chart here. But imagine an alternative scenario in which a VPP is operating in your neighborhood. And some of the homes have been pre-cooled around 3 p.m. so the AC doesn't have to work as hard in the evening. And the VPP has rescheduled EV charging to begin at 10 or 11 p.m. instead of right when the car is plugged in. And some of the homes are running off of an in-home battery that has been charged with solar energy midday. That dramatically decreases the peak demand on the grid, the green line in this chart, so that we don't have to turn on peaker plants that are disproportionately polluting low-income communities, and we can spend less or spend less quickly on upgrading our grid equipment. And all of this with little to no inconvenience to the participants who are getting paid to participate in the VPP. By the way, the majority of the cost of a VPP flows right back to payments to those participants. So if VPPs offer all of these different benefits, why are we at the Department of Energy talking about them so much now? They've been around in some form for decades. Well, the answer in large part is that we are about to experience a tsunami of distributed energy resource adoption. And that's true across three categories. You have resources that generate electricity. That's the left side of this page here, adding about 20 to 35 gigawatts of capacity in each year between now and 2030. It also includes resources that consume electricity, but at flexible times. Now, to put these numbers in perspective, four to six gigawatts of flexible demand is roughly equivalent to 50 peaker plants worth of supply. And almost 25 gigawatt hours of storage resources coming online in 2030, that's the equivalent of over 400 utility scale batteries. That is an enormous amount of capacity, but it pales in comparison when you take a look at electric vehicle capacity coming online. We are adding dozens of gigawatts of demand and hundreds of gigawatt hours of storage capacity from EV chargers and EV batteries each year between now and 2030. And now, not all of those cars will be plugged in at the same time or charging, and not all of that charging is flexible, but even a fraction of that is available to a virtual power plant, that's an incredible amount of flexibility for the grid. 
Now, before we take a look at what that means for the growth potential of virtual power plants, let's take a look at our starting point. Virtual power plants have about 30 to 60 gigawatts of capacity operating across the country today. But it's very concentrated in a handful of states that have favorable market rules and regulations. And it's no coincidence that those states, the ones in dark green here, they're the same states that are experiencing the fastest adoption of electric vehicles, where the need for this solution is the most acute. But it's time to move beyond patchwork deployment to VPPs at scale. We're really at an inflection point. We have unprecedented distributed energy resource adoption. Those resources are app-enabled, Wi-Fi connected, Bluetooth, like they have been never before. And we have models that have been proven out across the country that we can learn from. And the need is urgent. This chart shows that at the same time as we're adding 60 gigawatts of peak to the grid, the difference between the 2023 and 2030 bars, we're also retiring a lot of old coal plants and old gas plants, such that we have 200 gigawatts of peak demand that must be served by new resources added to the grid by 2030. If we can triple the capacity of virtual power plants, which, based on the distributed energy resource growth rates we just took a look at, is feasible, we can address 10 to 20% of that peak demand, and in doing so, we would save $10 billion per year from lower spending on peaker plants and grid upgrades. And as important as that $10 billion is that we're not spending, the money that we are spending, the majority of it, again, is flowing right back to participants. So what will it take? Liftoff for virtual power plants requires progress along five imperatives. The first is to expand distributed energy resource adoption with equitable benefits. We have to make sure that the cost savings, the reliability, the air quality benefits don't just accrue to the communities that can afford EVs and rooftop solar today. Second, we need to simplify VPP enrollment so that as those resources come online, they are aggregated and used productively in a virtual power plant. And third, we need to increase standardization of virtual power plant operations. So there's been a lot of great innovation with VPPs and how they operate and the services that they provide. But with that has come a great deal of complexity. And we need to find and use models that can be replicated across the country and scale up faster. Finally, we need to increase the way that VPPs are integrated into how utilities plan and how they are compensated, as well as how we operate wholesale markets. So at the Department of Energy, we already have over 25 different but complementary programs that are supporting the deployment of virtual power plants and addressing issues across these five imperatives. But it's going to take more action from a very wide range of stakeholders. We need utilities, VPP companies, community organizations, investors, workforce development organizations. We need everyone dedicating resources if we're going to triple the capacity by 2030. And we need to work together to realize a world in which our grid operates more effectively, we stop polluting communities with peaker plants, and we achieve affordable and reliable electricity for all Americans. Thank you.